Good morning and welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God, His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. Sharper Iron is underwritten by the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. On this Thursday, July 30th, we are studying Judges chapter 12, verses 1 through 15. The infighting among the people of Israel that came about during the days of Gideon comes about once again during the days of Jephthah. It's another sign of the spiritual decay eating away at the people of God during the time of the Judges. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's Word today, we have with us regular guest, Pastor Mark Bars. Pastor Bars serves at Crown of Life Lutheran Church in San Antonio, Texas. Pastor Bars, welcome back to Sharper Iron. Good morning, Pastor Apple. Great to be with you and with our hearers again today. As we get started this morning, Pastor Bars, let's let's talk the book of Judges in general, get our get our feet back into this book. We, we've seen it over and over again, but there's things that are helpful to remember anytime we look at a text from the book of Judges. So as we prepare to see the end of Jephthah and a few very minor judges within the book, what do we need to know about the book as a whole going in? I know that some of our hearers have worked through this with with you and the other guests on Sharper Iron, so they've heard some of this before, but perhaps there's others who are not or just choosing to listen right now. I'm going to use Judges 3 verse 9 as a key verse to describe the whole book. It says, but when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the people of Israel who saved them. So the deliverer is a savior. Now we end up calling them judges, even though uh, curiously, but interestingly, the noun never appears in this book. It will only be a phrase, uh, this person judged Israel. But what is, what is God doing? You, you, um, the expression maybe that, that I've looked at is that there is a, a hitting bottom at times. And we know that phrase of, some people who struggle in life or perhaps struggle with an addiction, someone hits bottom, and it seems as though it happens to Israel, and then it happens again, and and it happens again. Uh, But when they cry out, do they cry out in repentance? Yes, at times, that's clearly happening. Do they cry out in distress? The Lord will raise up a deliverer. But there are also moments where Yahweh, where the Lord is silent. It's in essence as though God becomes Israel's enemy when he allows this, and and he has to be their enemy when they are unfaithful. Now I'm going to bring in another scripture that I think not only for the book of Judges, but for many times when we read and when we struggle with with what God is doing and what his rebellious runaway people are doing is from, is from Timothy. It's Paul writing in, in second Timothy. And when it, when it closes, second Timothy uh, chapter two, verse 13, when we are faithless, he will remain faithful because God will, will not let his people go. In fact, just this, just this past Sunday, uh, in the Old Testament reading from the book of from the book of Deuteronomy, we heard we heard these words that the Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession. And that reading closed, this is Deuteronomy 7, verse 9. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. This faithful God is the God who shows himself in the book of Judges when his people, the individuals and and corporately, are often unfaithful. God's faithfulness is something that we always have to keep in mind when it comes to the book of Judges in order to find gospel in it. I think other, and we'll talk about this, I know, more later. Otherwise, the book of Judges can become a, a very depressing thing. But to see God's faithfulness in all of it is so important. 
and I, the way you talked about, you know, sometimes God shows himself or acts as Israel's enemy. I think that too is a part of God's faithfulness within it because this is what he's promised his people. He's told his people what will happen should they fall into idolatry. And they do that over and over and over again. And so God showing himself in an in a hostile way towards them, in a way of judgment, in the way of the law, perhaps we could say it like that. That's a part of his faithfulness too, that his people would recognize where the idolatry actually goes. And in that he does his alien work. We sometimes use that as his, his work that he doesn't, he, he does in order to do his proper work, which is to save. He, he leads to repentance in order to, to rescue. And so his faithfulness, I really think is a way that ties those two things together. Well said. The the sequence that isn't just in in ju- in Judges, it's uh, many times in in Genesis and Exodus is is a a sequence of of sin, then judgment, then mercy, and and promise that that God will speak and will act. Uh, the the wonderful language that that God speaks on on Mount Sinai, He speaks it uh, particularly when Moses is given the two new tablets after he, in, in righteous anger, destroys them when they have uh, danced in front of the golden calf, when the Israelites have. But God says this, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and there's that word again, and faithfulness. Hmm. So sin, judgment, mercy, promise. Uh, in the book of Judges, the people do what is evil in the sight of the Lord. That phrase is repeated over and over again. They suffer, and sometimes they suffer for years. Sometimes they suffer because uh, foreign powers make them their slaves, their subjects. They cry out to the Lord, and and Yahweh acts, who raises up deliverers, judges for them. The other, and I, I want to come back to something you said at the, the very beginning too about the Old Testament reading from Deuteronomy seven. The the thing that I, I love about that reading, particularly from Deuteronomy seven, is is where the Lord is is reminding his people why he loves them, and he says he doesn't love them because they were so numerous. In fact, they were the fewest. He says, but but what he ends up coming around and saying is he loves them because he loves them. Is is it is essentially what he says? That's why he loves them because. He, that's who he is, and he's made his promise. And again, that that faithfulness, that love of the Lord, the love of Yahweh, is really what ties this book together. And I, I think it, it helps us to to see accounts like we're going to look at today, accounts where the people are faithless, accounts where they're receiving the Lord's judgment. It, it really helps us to to hold those texts together and not just throw them out. Well, God's being mean. No, He's not. He's loving his people throughout this, and and his goal is to bring them back to himself. Uh, Pastor Barsh, feel free to to comment further on that and these matters concerning the book of Judges as a whole. And also then, let's start to to think more particularly about the cycle we find ourselves in here. We're, We're at the end of Jephthah's account, and it's probably good to do a bit of review as to what we've seen from him so far and how that prepares us for what we've got today. Of course. So, so we have this this book that fits between the conquest, the taking, uh, the taking of the land. Uh, conquest is perhaps not always the right mm-hmm. word to use because we know that there were pockets and places that that were not totally able to be claimed either by either by apathy or or by resistance. But the the, the taking of the land, the, the being given the promised land, crossing the Jordan after the forty years of wandering. And then the end, the timeline will change, particularly even though uh, Samuel will will have uh, some other events that happen that will be leading us uh, the books of, of the book of Samuel, but leading us toward the first the first official king when Saul is made king. So we have approximately three hundred years of of this of this history that is also the salvation story. I don't know if when you were at Lutheran High School in San Antonio, Pastor Apple, if if you used the word Heilskeshikta, Heilskeshikta, <laughs> but the the salvation story. I mean, this that's what this is. Even as and I and I hope that our our hearers will grasp that with us today about about who the final and ultimate judge is. 
but but how does all this fit together and how does Jephthah, uh, how is he uh, an actor in this? Jephthah is, is, well, there's some interesting things. First of all, he's from a region that is not one of the 12 tribes. I actually have an atlas open in front of me, one that I've owned since my college years, and it has the 12 tribes and they're all highlighted so that I can see where they're all lined up. And some of them end up on the east side of the Jordan River. The Jordan River is, you know, it's not it's not a huge deep river valley, but it is a significant division point geographically and physically. The terrain does change. And and so to be on the other side of the Jordan, sometimes we call it the Trans Jordan, is is significant. And Half of the tribe of Manasseh is there, and Gad is there, and Reuben is there to the south and to the east. But right in the middle is a place we learn is also called Gilead. And, and it's named back in Genesis when, when Jacob travels to and from Laban. And if you remember, this would be in chapters 31 and, and 32 of, of Genesis, that there is a a heap of stones put up, a heap of stones. Jacob calls it a galid, and same vowels or same consonants, excuse me, but Gilead, galid, it, it's this place. It's, it's a region. It's an area. And one of the other geographical points is the river Jabbok that is there, because this is where Jacob will, will have that wrestling match uh, before he meets his brother, before he meets his brother Esau. So these, this is part of the the whole longer history of of God's people. But this is where uh, this man uh, Jephthah would call home. But his own his own personal story is that he's born to a father, a father that shares he shares with other siblings, but born to a woman who was a prostitute. So even within his, his family, and this is what the last couple of days, uh, the, your, your other guests have helped, helped work through in chapter 11. So he is, he's part of a family, but he's on the outside of a family. And then he even spends some time away up to another place to the, to the north and to the east called Tob. And, and he's told, you need to come back. We want you to, we want you to lead us. And he agrees to do so. But, but there's this, I'll use the word contention that is, that is part of his whole backstory. It's contention with his family. And sadly, later on in the second half of, of chapter 11, it was uh, the contention about his daughter and his, and his terrible tragic vow. It's contention with his, with his own tribe as to will he be a leader and contention with the Ammonites, with the, with a foreign, with a foreign people, but then uh, the tension with the the tribe of Ephraim that that there will be this conflict, which is a a key factor in the whole narrative of chapter twelve here. I think contention is a good word to describe Jephthah, and I mean as I, as I reflect on just where we've been in the book of Judges so far, and I will say that Jephthah is not, I don't think, one of the the best known judges of the book in terms of if I had to rank them, Samson is probably the most well known. Gideon is right there underneath. And then after you get past Samson and Gideon, then maybe it's a a bit of a toss up in terms of the space that gets dedicated to the judges in the book. Jephthah is, is up there. He, I think he's, I mean, this is just a very unscientific quick glance back, but Samson and Gideon have the most space. And I think Jephthah's probably third when it comes to individuals. Maybe Deborah and Barak get, get the same amount of space as Jephthah. But, but he's pretty important. But I, I think all of this is a long way of saying that contentious is a good word to describe him. He's, he's not your typical hero. When you, you think about a, a, somebody you're going to put as the hero of the story, Jephthah, who starts off as the son of a prostitute, he makes this awful vow that ends up getting his only daughter killed. He's not the guy that you would think would be the hero of the story. 
And yet he's going to get named in Hebrews chapter 11 as one of the men who live by faith, which is just an astounding thing. And, and maybe we can come back and reflect on that more towards the end after we, we read how his account ends today. It, it's just amazing to see how the Lord takes this contentious individual whose, whose life is filled with contention and through all of the sins and errors and faults of Jephthah and the people around him, the Lord still works out that salvation story that's all pointing us forward to Christ. I, I said quite a bit there, Pastor Bars, and, and maybe that, do you want to respond to any of that right now while we're talking about it, or do you want to save some of that for the end? Well, no, I, I think you're right. The, there is there is some mystery to this, that that this man would, would first of all, be uh, one who, who, who judges, who serves, who serves as a judge. Uh, he, it's, it's of, uh, it's interesting that this is, this is where we actually, this is where we actually get the phrase in verse seven. We haven't actually gone through verse by verse yet, but Jephthah judged Israel six years. That's the first time that phrase is used in the book of Judges, even though we're already in, in chapter 12, that phrasing as such. And you're right that, that he would be, that he would be included in the divine in the divine narrative in inspired scripture as one who who lives who lives by faith who who lives because he sees something beyond himself which is hard for us to see at, at times this is perhaps one of those stories where where we might say and I'd go back into the previous chapter which was presented yesterday with with again that vow about his daughter why are these things why are these things in Scripture? In in some in some way, I I don't want to push this argument, but I've had this conversation with people over the years. It it almost can can give us a greater certainty and and trust in the in the authority of Scripture, the truth and the truth of Scripture that these stories are in there because it's not how we would write it. We would we would only tell all the good things. We would only want all the all the true heroes to be to be featured. We we don't want we don't want Samson. You'll get the Samson in the in the coming days. We don't want all those things that that Samson does getting wrapped around the little finger of of these of these manipulative women. No, we want we want true and 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 noble heroes. That that perhaps is one of the reasons why why we can see that as God has has given us this book. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10, that these were written for our instruction. Mm. And, and part of the instruction has to be that weak and feeble and people who, from almost every perspective, are less than ideal, yet God not only shows mercy to them, he doesn't give them what they deserve. He will show grace to them and give them what they don't deserve, even as he does so to you and to me. Right. Yeah. I mean, this is a, a, it lends credibility to the scriptures for sure. And it, it, I mean, if it, if, if the scriptures didn't present these people, how, how could we look at it as a, as a true, true account? It, it would be so idealistic that, that there just would be no way to read it realistically. And so we, we need accounts like this so that we are reminded of the great depths of our sin, that matter of instruction, and that we see that, that these are real sinners who need a real savior. They're not just sort of imaginary sinners who, who say it on Sunday morning and don't really mean it. But but these are, these are people who have actually sinned in real ways, and they have a savior who came and bled and died and rose for them in their, in their real, real sins. And, and to put it right in front of our face is, is not a bad thing. It's, it's a good thing so that we too would see our sin, our real sins, not just, not just imaginary ones, but real sins that have hurt real people have, have been offensive to the real God. And yet he's the one who sent his son to bleed, to die, to rise for our forgiveness. And, and that, I mean, this may seem a far afield from Jephthah, but, but this account of Jephthah and the three judges will get after him. It's a part of that entire story of salvation in which we find ourselves. So let's go ahead and, and read. We're in Judges 12. I'm going to read verses 1 through 7, which is the end of the account of Jephthah. So Judges 12, verse 1. 
The men of Ephraim were called to arms, and they crossed to Zephon and said to Jephthah, Why did you cross over to fight against the Ammonites and did not call us to go with you? We will burn your house over, over you with fire. And Jephthah said to them, I and my people had a great dispute with the Ammonites, and when I called you, you did not save me from their hand. And when I saw that you would not save me, I took my life in my hand and crossed over against the Ammonites, and the Lord gave them into my hand. Why then have you come up to me this day to fight against me? Then Jephthah gathered all the men of Gilead and fought with Ephraim. And the men of Gilead struck Ephraim because they said, You are fugitives of Ephraim, you Gileadites, in the midst of Ephraim and Manasseh. And the Gileadites captured the fords of the Jordan against the Ephraimites. And when any of the fugitives of Ephraim said, Let me go over, the men of Gilead said to him, Are you an Ephraimite? When he said, No, they said to him, Then say Shibboleth. And he said, Sibboleth, for he could not pronounce it right. Then they seized him and slaughtered him at the fords of the Jordan. At that time, 42,000 of the Ephraimites fell. Jephthah judged Israel six years. Then Jephthah the Gileadite died and was buried in his city in Gilead. That's Judges 12, verses 1 through 7, the end of the account of Jephthah. So, Pastor Bars, the first thing that stands out to me in this text is we've got the men of Ephraim who come and complain to a judge. And that sounds awfully familiar from the book of Judges. So, the tribe of Ephraim is in, is in central uh, Israel, north to south. It's uh, it's perhaps uh, from Jerusalem. You might you might go uh, thirty to forty miles north of Jerusalem and find in that area Shiloh, which is now uh, at this time in the Book of Judges, the center for worship is located in Ephraim. That may be part of the arrogance of this tribe that. Uh, they they have shown it. They they showed it earlier in their response to uh, Gideon, and now it will happen again. They they think quite highly of themselves. Paul in Romans chapter twelve, do not think of yourself more highly than than you ought. It says in in verse one they were called to arms. They were cried out to uh, the 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 call to battle, but. It seems as though, I'm just saying how I hear this and put this in sequence, as though they heard it and and they delayed because then they will ask pretty soon of Jephthah, well, why did you go ahead and fight the Ammonites without us? But they crossed to Zephon, and again, I tried to give some geography. The Jordan River runs between uh, the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea, the Salt Sea. It actually, the headwaters are farther north of the Sea of Galilee, any number of miles, even up towards towards Mount Hermon. But but in the in the Jordan River Valley, this is approximately halfway between uh, the Dead Sea and and the Sea of Galilee. And so they they do cross the river and then they confront Jephthah and say, why didn't you call us to go with you? Well, isn't that what we just read they, that they were called and they didn't. That's why I'm suggesting there was delay on their part. Maybe it was even maybe it was part of their their arrogance. There seemed to be egos certainly at work here. Well, we'll come and, and be the be the ones who ride in for, for the rescue. And and this threat they make, we, we will burn your house over you with fire. Now, you and I may think that's rather trivial, but but I will point ahead our hearers uh, to the next the next uh, story of Samson that that's one of the ways that that uh, those who are trying to get the riddle solved uh, try to say to Samson's wife we'll burn your house down and and there were no fire departments there I mean if if you even though you build a house of stone you built a ha- you built you built a roof with timbers and it would collapse and we'll burn your house over you over you with fire I also wonder, and I only, I can only say this, I'm just, you read something over and I've been doing that in preparation for our conversation this morning, is, is I wonder if this is something also that is a taunt against him because of his daughter. They know his family is fractured. They know his, his own birth family, that contention word that I used before, but they know is the loss, the loss of his daughter as well. He, Jephthah had no father. 
uh, no, not a father with status because he wasn't born into this marriage and he's lost his daughter. He has, in some ways, no past and no future. Uh, and, and also that the decision that he made with, with his, with his daughter that he was willing, however, to sacrifice anything. I, I, he didn't know who was going to come out the gate out of the door, but, but he once more perhaps showing, showing this man's arrogance. Well, what is Jeff to say? How does he reply to the question? Verse two. Well, I and my people had a great dispute with the Ammonites. It was, it was my dispute, the Gilead, the Gileadites and I, it was our problem. We should have to solve it. I called you, but you didn't save me. You didn't act as that deliverer. You didn't respond as, as quickly when I saw that you would not save me. Verse three, I took my life in my hand. I will say that there is a different way that, that Jephthah chooses to phrase this that does reveal something about his character, that it will be what he is able to do. One of the, one of the, I don't want to say it's a subtle thing, but it's perhaps not the first thing we observe in this, in this whole narrative of Jephthah is, is the power of the spoken word. And, and of course there is, there are good things that happen when, when words are spoken that are affirming and, and strengthening and, and encouraging. But there are also words that are spoken for ill. And, and that's what is already happening here when, and also that he, he has this, not just an arrogance, but an independence. God doesn't call his people to be independent, but to be, first of all, dependent upon him, of course, but, but interdependent. And if he asks for help, uh, from the, if he asked for help from the Ephraimites, why couldn't he, why couldn't he have waited? Yet he does say, the Lord gave them into my hand. I mean, to, I've given credit for, for phrasing it in that way, for saying it mm. in that way, even though it, it seems to me to jar a bit against his, his I, I, and me, and my language. Mm. Uh, agreed. That, 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 that one phrase, we want to give him credit for that, but otherwise it, there is this matter of, of brother versus brother. And and we've seen this within the book of Judges before. We're seeing it here again. And I think we'll reflect more on that on the other side of the break. You're listening to Sharper Iron here on KFUO. We're going to take a short break, but we will be right back. Please stick around. Since 1978, Lutheran Church Extension Fund has had the humble privilege of supporting Lutheran Church Missouri Synod Ministries and her workers. Thanks to faithful investors, LCEF has provided thousands of church workers, congregations, schools, and organizations with the low-cost loans and resources they need to reach more people with the saving name of Christ. To learn more, visit lcef.org or call 800-843-5233, 800-843-5233. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Thursday, July 30th. We're looking at Judges chapter 12, verses 1 through 15. We've got Pastor Mark Bars with us. He serves at Crown of Life Lutheran Church in San Antonio, Texas. Pastor Bars, prior to the break, we were were talking about this initial contention between Jephthah and the men of Ephraim. And we've seen the men of Ephraim become contentious before with Gideon. Gideon was a bit more diplomatic than Jephthah has proved so far. You you mentioned prior to the break that perhaps the location of Shiloh being the center of Israel's worship at the time could have been a cause of some of the arrogance that seems to be prevalent within the people of Ephraim. I, I traced Ephraim through the book of Judges very quickly in preparation for this, and the men of Ephraim did respond positively to the call to arms from Ehud earlier in the book, as well as Deborah and Barak, and they don't start to become contentious until Gideon. And so I, I wonder if perhaps their early success and participation in these victories, maybe the glory went to their head a little bit, and it comes out more as you, as the book progresses. And and I do think, though, more importantly than, than how that happened is this theme that we've seen in the book of Judges 
And this is one of those misconceptions, I think, when it comes to the book of Judges, that when it says one of these deliverers judged Israel or ruled over Israel, it wasn't Israel as a whole, but it was much more tribal in nature. And as we've seen the book progress, that tribal nature of the people of Israel has turned violent at times where the people of Israel, even during what should be a time of rest that the Lord is giving, they're fighting within themselves. And that's one of the the great tragedies of the book is this matter of brother versus brother. So help us help us to see that here in the book of Judges and and also take us into that as a matter of our lives as Christians. Well, let's go back to let's go back to the their earlier story, right? Where does where does their their swagger come from? Uh, part of it may well be their numbers and the space mm-hmm. they are given. So so they hold a great deal of territory. Uh, probably, I'm looking at my map again, when they go both on the west and the east sides of the Jordan River, uh, more territory than any of the other tribes. Do they hold that much territory because they are greater, uh, greater, greater in numbers so that 42,000 of them can can be killed at the ford of the river uh, out but but is part of their swagger because well of course you would call us to come to help you because we're your big brother or we're we've got we've got uh, more resources than than anyone else had the the other and and it and it is a, a fabric that seems to be woven into this, into not only this story, but the book of Judges, and it, and it will continue on, I think, until, until there is a unified kingdom is that, you know, we talk about the promised land and, and they're given Canaan and they take over this land, but it's not a central government. There's, it's not Jerusalem yet. That hasn't been made the capital city. So, so it is, it is very tribal and, and perhaps even worse than that in certain individuals. And I think Jephthah is one of them. It's first the individual and then the tribe and, and then almost as an afterthought, the nation. So, so why wouldn't he get into a, a, a shouting match, uh, a taunting, a trading of insults when, when the, uh, Ephraimites say, you are fugitives, you Gileadites. You're in the midst of Ephraim and Manasseh. You're, you're just kind of caught between us. You're sort of the stepchild, whatever. And they know his own story. They know Jephthah's, Jephthah's personal and, and family story, but, but it's, but it's, it's demeaning in that way. And this using this language of the fugitive, hang on to that for a little, a little while. Uh, hearers, if you would, if you would maybe look ahead, if you haven't done so already, and see how it will come back in just a moment. But you're the fugitives, you're the runaways. You don't really belong with the rest of us. But what happens in the campaign? They are they have chased the Ammonites away first, chasing them farther to the east. They they fought against them, but then they capture the fords. The the Ammonites, if I if I may say, the Ammonites had crossed over the Jordan themselves. They had crossed from the east side to the west side. They've, they've pushed them back, and the, the, Gilead, the Gileadites captured the fords of the Jordan against the Ephraimites. They, they know tactics. They know that this is where you have to cross. The Jordan is not a, a huge, wide, rushing river, but there are deeper spots and there are lower spots. You want to control the fords. You want to do so. This is what Ehud did uh, earlier on. He used the Ephraimites uh, as part of his forces in chap- back in chapter three. So they know that this is this is how you fight a battle. And when they try to return home, this is in the second half of verse five. When they are, and notice what they're called now. They're called the fugitives. They who taunted the Gileadites. For being fugitives, for not re- for being half breeds, for not really having a home and a place, they are now the fugitives. They're trying to get to get back home. You you have to wonder also about even the uh, the military common sense of this to have allowed the Ford not to be held 
and defended to to head across and then not be able to get back, especially after you have you have taunted your brother, as it were, their fellow Israelites, yes, taunted your brother. They say, let me go over. And then here's this conversation. It's at the end of verse 5 and into chapter 6. The men of Gilead would say to this fugitive, are you an Ephraimite? When he said no, he wouldn't claim to be because he knows how they've taunted. He knows what what has happened already. Well, then they asked the question, then say Shibboleth. And he said, Shibboleth. He was not able to, he could not pronounce it right. He couldn't say the S-H sound. He would only say it with an S sound. Now, we could, we could talk about a lot of different things about how, and, and let me ask you this question, Pastor Apple. I think I know the answer. Are you a native Texan? That's that that is a, a true statement. I am. Yes. If you if you check out my bio on KFUO, you'll you'll notice the theme. <laughs> <laughs> and I knew and I knew the answer to that question before I asked it. Obviously, obviously. Well, well. Let let me uh, tell you that there's a river not too far north of San Antonio. It's near the ranch area where uh, President Lyndon Baines Johnson was from. And and you know the name of that river? That's, yeah. That's right. That's the Pertinalis River. Ah, yeah. Excuse me? There, <laughs> there's an R in there? <laughs> that's We're right. We're a little fun here, and, and if you're not native Texans, and I'm not, and he is, uh, the, the pronunciation, especially by President Johnson, put an R in the middle, in that word, the Pertinalis River, instead of the Pertinalis River. Uh, but these these Ephraimites wanted to get back home. They couldn't. They couldn't make the right sound, and and it was and it was a giveaway. Mm. I, I find it so interesting and irony in in this way that they accused Jephthah and the Gileadites of denying and being fugitives from their tribe, and then they want to pretend that they are part of that tribe themselves because it means their safety. It means they'll be allowed Mm. to cross the ford and to return to their home. Instead, they are not. And one one of the imponderables here is that Yahweh would allow this this slaughter. It, it's 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 as if uh, again uh, the downward spiral. Uh, they they've hit bottom. Can it get any worse? That they not only it's one thing to taunt each other. It's another to take their lives. They will they will never see uh, another another sunrise. Uh, they will their their life their life is ended. If 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 I could and. Maybe you know me well enough to know this, that, that I, I really enjoy studying World War II history. I'm, I'm not sure all why I did have uncles who served, uh, who served in, in both the Pacific and the European theaters. But, but I have read that the Dutch underground did much the same thing in order to screen out German spies. There's a name of, of a city in the Netherlands, and they would ask them to say Scheveningen. And that's, that's, I think I'm close. I looked it up how they would pronounce it. But only it says only the Dutch can say it properly. And the Germans would, I don't know, hmm. you, you've studied German more than I have, would, would misspeak it. And, and the spy would be identified. But, but how, it's, it's not, it's not simply that that they find out someone's true identity. It's it's the uh, the callousness, the, uh, the the hate that that becomes operative in the situation that makes this so sad. Once again, brother against brother. I I can't help but think of Cain in Genesis chapter four, who who dares to dares to reply, "Am I my brother's keeper?" And and uh, the one who has uh, the one who has who has killed his his own brother. How how tragic that it that it would come to this. And and in the whole narrative and the whole Heilsgeschichte and the whole salvation story, 
it, it, it's going to point us to the one to to the one who will be our brother, who will come to bring his people together again, to to call us by name and and to to unite not simply Israel as a kingdom, but but to as as the writer to the Hebrews way, he is not ashamed to call us his brothers. Christ Jesus, who will bring us bring us into His church, into into the family of God. I think I've moved from Judges chapter twelve and all of that, but but please let's continue our conversation. No, that that's that's all that's very good, and I I, I think the connection to the question that Cain asks concerning "Am I my brother's keeper?" the answer of which is yes, you are, is is very good to consider here. the The thing with the the Shibboleth. Sibboleth that that my mind goes to would be the the way that the language is used to divide reminds me a lot of the Tower of of Babel or the Tower of Babel, however, mm. whichever way you want to pronounce it, where the language ends up dividing them, and then the Lord reverses that on the day of Pentecost, where uh, yeah. although the language is different, the they're speaking in different languages that day, yet they're all hearing the same thing. They're hearing the mighty works of God done in Christ Jesus. And and putting those things together with this, I, I, the tragedy, I think, becomes all the more apparent that, that the name, that the language here is used as a way to identify a fellow Israelite in order to kill him rather than allowing the confession, which for the people of Israel, I think the confession we would we would say would have been the Lord our God, the Lord is one, Deuteronomy chapter six, verse four. For us today, we would say Jesus is Lord would be that one confession. And whether you say Shibboleth or Sibboleth, among the people of Israel who all confess Yahweh as the one true God, Shibboleth, Sibboleth shouldn't make a difference. Much like today, when when we confess Jesus is Lord, it shouldn't matter if I if I pronounce His name Jesus or Jesus or Jesus or, or pick your language, uh, Ye, cre, Jesu German, right? I mean, pick your language. How how do you pronounce it? That's not the point. That's not what divides or unites the church. What unites the church is is the confession of Jesus Christ as Lord and all that that means, and to see the way language is used here as a dividing marker, and then even more so with the purpose of killing, as Cain once did to his brother Abel, just makes the situation all the more, all the more tragic. And, it, and we spoke earlier in our conversation today, we spoke earlier about uh, what we heard this past Sunday, didn't we, from, mm. from uh, Deuteronomy chapter 7, that, that this, this chosen people, chosen as, as you pointed out, not because whether it was Ephraim or whatever tribe it was, or the whole nation being so numerous, no, but he set his love on you and chose you. The God who, who brought his people out of Israel, who, who brought them through the wilderness, who sustained them with, with the manna, with the bread and, and the quail, and, and then brought them into the land, brought them into the land of Canaan. This this is the one. This is the one who has made them his his treasured possession. Uh, perhaps again, the the signs, the indications, the the actions of brokenness here are, are to are to teach us. Uh, I mentioned Paul again from First Corinthians ten. I'll, I'll mention it again. Is, is it for our instruction? What not just to we can do better. We can we can treat each other differently. No, but that but that. All the brokenness is is what we bring to our God in repentance, and and it is that which, which for which we need to be judged, mm. for which for which which we confess that we have sinned by what we have done and what we have left undone, all that all of that, and and to hear a promise and to hear a gift and to hear uh, the good news proclaimed to us is. Is the gift, the treasure that that we share, uh, to be, uh, to be in in the in the roles that you and I are given as as pastors to the people of God. What what a great what a great privilege. What a what a high responsibility as well. Mm. We've got about ten minutes left, Pastor Barge. I'm going to go ahead and read the rest of our text for today, which is we're in Judges 12, and after Jephthah, before you get to Samson, there are a few 
what I think we would call minor judges. Minor because they are only given a couple of verses here in the book, but this is sacred scripture. We should read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest all of it. And so we're gonna we're gonna look at these and, and make a few comments on them. And I think we'll close our time with a few more reflections on Jephthah and the book of Judges as a whole, particularly as it points us to Christ. So first, Judges 12, verses eight through 15. After him, that's after Jephthah, Ibzan of Bethlehem judged Israel. He had 30 sons and 30 daughters he gave in marriage outside his clan, and 30 daughters he brought in from outside for his sons. And he judged Israel seven years. Then Ibzan died and was buried at Bethlehem. After him, Elon the Zebulite, Zebulonite judged Israel, and he judged Israel ten years. Then Elon the Zebulonite died and was buried at Aijalon in the land of Zebulun. After him, Abdon the son of Hillel, the Pirithonite, judged Israel. He had 40 sons and 30 grandsons who rode on 70 donkeys, and he judged Israel eight years. Then Abdon, the son of Hillel, the Pirithonite, died and was buried at Pirithon in the land of Ephraim in the hill country of the Amalekites. That's Judges 12, verses 8 through 15. Pastor Bar's three judges there. Not a ton of information. What do, what do we need to know about these three men? Well, first of all, the major and the minor judges uh, this is this is part of the whole story. Uh, why it is that that some are mentioned and some are only barely mentioned? I, I will point out what we said earlier is that none of them rule Israel as a whole, not as we know the f- full northern and southern kingdoms, all of the twelve tribes. So now we have at least the first two are from the north, Zebulun is to the west of the Sea of Galilee. It's not a huge geographical area that they are given. So the Bethlehem mentioned here is a house of bread, yes, but it's not the Bethlehem in Judah. It's a different Bethlehem. It's not the first time that there are common common names. Uh, 30 sons and 30 daughters, uh, we might say, really, is that even possible? And unfortunately, knowing the multiple wives and the concubines. Yes, he gave the 30 daughters in marriage outside his clan. It doesn't say he gave them outside of, of Israel. Uh, we, it, it's possible that that's true. And 30 daughters, uh, and 30 daughters he brought in from outside, daughters-in-law, to marry, to marry his sons. He judges for seven years, and he's buried at Bethlehem, once more Bethlehem up in the north. We get very little about Elon, the Zebulun, Zebulonite, uh, just that he is from the north as well, from this, from this same, from this same northern region. And then uh, Abdon, so 40 sons and 30 grandsons. I, I'm blessed with grandsons. In fact, one of your sons, I have a grandson by that name now, a newborn named Caleb. And donkeys? I think this would be too much fun. Uh, It may simply show his, his wealth, show his, his influence. When we hear, when we hear Job described, it will be much more than that with, with all of his possessions, but it might simply be a way to say he was a man of wealth and of influence. He is buried in the central hill country in the, in the land of Ephraim. So in the central in the central country as well. But, but once more, these major judges and these minor judges are, are perhaps more, more, uh, regional. And, and the fact that, and the fact that, uh, this seems to be still too much the mindset. I, I would call myself, uh, uh, a member of the tribe of Issachar before I would tell you that I'm an Israelite. Uh, this is, this is one of the, things that seems to stand behind this brother against brother, this uncivil war. I know civil doesn't mean polite in that sense, but, but that's what, what has happened too often and certainly happened with Jephthah and, and, the, um, and the Ephraimites today in, our, in, our, in this chapter, chapter 12. Pastor Bars, with about five minutes left, reflecting on the account of Jephthah, this whole chapter in, in which we see this matter of brother against brother, the very tribal nature of the people of Israel, the Lord using very sinful men to accomplish his deliverance. How do we see the gospel in this text? How does this text point us toward our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Well, sometimes we see the gospel by way of contrast. 
we we see what is and what is described depicted here and and i'm going to start by by reflecting a little bit more on the the brother versus brother versus brother and and yet the language of of the new testament uh, will say wonderful things when paul will write in ephesians chapter 3 that that we are members of the household of god and 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 what a delightful what a delightful way to express who we are, that we have a common identity. The father who says, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. He said that He said that to Timothy, and he said that to Mark at our baptism. He said, with you I am well pleased, uh, not because of anything we did or even had the potential to do, but because Deuteronomy chapter 7, why have we come back to that so often today? Hmm. It, it's because he, is, because he has love for us. And then what is, what is our response? Just several Sundays ago, we also heard from Romans that, that by the Spirit we cry out, Abba, Father. Mm-hmm. We can know who our Father is. Jephthah, the brokenness in that, in that family, perhaps not, not to turn this into psychological analysis into why he did and said and acted the way he did, but, but we know that we have a father. We know that we have a father who loves and who cares and forgives, who is the father in Luke 15, whose arms are wide open to welcome runaway sons and runaway daughters. The second, the second is, is to once again, by way of contrast, the, the richness of the gospel. Who is the, who is the ultimate judge? Well, it, it's God. And, and and yet that can be a statement of a fear and and at times when we read the law when god is doing his alien work we say he is my judge but how is that judgment carried out that judgment is carried out when jesus christ is judged for us on the cross the one who knew no sin became sin for us and so suffers and dies. He is judged and we are judged not guilty. We are justified. We are declared not guilty. And we say, and we, and we say in the creed that he will come to judge the living and the dead. There will be a public, a public announcement made. We who trust Christ, who know Christ in faith, have no fear. We, we, are, we are the redeemed. God has made us his own sons and daughters. But there will be as sheep and goats are separated, as Jesus says in Matthew 25. So there will be a public judgment at the last, at the last day. I can't help but also remind our hearers of the other readings they likely heard this past Sunday. They heard from Romans chapter 8, and they heard this, if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And that ending of Romans chapter 8 says this finally, nothing in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Why? Because the kingdom of heaven parables that Jesus told, God is the one who sees that we are his treasure in a field, a, a fine pearl who casts the net out and gathers and gathers it in. What, what, great, what great truths, what great comfort, what great joy are ours in knowing that our God has been the ultimate judge, which really means the ultimate savior or deliverer. He has brought his people through the wilderness. He is bringing us through the wilderness. He will bring us into the ultimate promised land. Pastor Mark Bars is the pastor serving at Crown of Life Lutheran Church in San Antonio, Texas, helping us this morning with Judges 12, verses 1 through 15. Pastor Bars, thanks for being our guest as always. It is so good to be with you, Pastor Apple. I'm your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. Thanks for spending the morning with us. Talk to you again tomorrow.